Now that uh, we have looked at the different forms of uh, China's economic relations with, with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, now we can uh, identify the various actors involved in the growing relations between uh, China and Africa. At the governmental level on the Chinese side, the main uh, ministries responsible for relations with the Sub-Saharan Africa are the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and the uh, Ministry of Commerce. These uh, two ministries uh, jointly chair the Chinese uh, follow-up committee of FOCA, Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. The MOFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, guides diplomatic policies on African issues and the overall decisions of FOCA. Uh, whereas, uh, Ministry of Commerce is responsible for trade, investment, and the implementation of a cooperation uh, process. Um, the two ministries do not always uh, see eye to eye, and uh, there has been conflict uh, between them. For example, over the control of uh, foreign aid, uh, which is uh, currently in the hands of uh, Ministry of Commerce. Uh, Ministry of Commerce views concessional loans principally as a market entry tool for Chinese companies whereas uh, the MOFA sees them as a way of uh, improving China's uh, diplomatic relations with African uh, countries. The picture is uh, further complicated by the role played by a number of Chinese uh, provincial governments which have developed links with the subnational governments in Africa and actively promoted the activities of their own provincial state-owned enterprises. Trade between China and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa involves uh, a variety of firms. As far as uh, Sub-Saharan uh, African exports are concerned, uh, these are mainly state-owned enterprises from both China and African exporting countries. On the import side, there is a much more diverse range of companies involved, including Chinese SOEs and private firms. Firms involved in construction and uh, other infrastructure projects in Africa are significant uh, importers of machinery and equipment to the region. Foreign companies with uh, subsidiaries in China also import from uh, China to supply uh, their African uh, markets. Consumer goods are imported by the growing number of Chinese traders who have set up uh, in Africa. Although there are no reliable figures on the number of Chinese traders active across the region, it has been significant enough to generate uh, hostility uh, in a number of uh, African countries. Increasing number of African traders are also involved in trade as uh, illustrated uh, by the growing African business community in Guangzhou. One estimate puts the numbers involved at uh, around 80,000. There may be as many as uh, 10,000 Chinese owned firms operating in the Sub-Saharan Africa. We can identify four different categories of Chinese firms active in Africa.
the SOEs of the central government, provincial and municipal uh, state-owned enterprises, private Chinese companies with subsidiaries in Africa, and the Chinese-owned small and medium enterprises. Uh, central SOEs come under the control of uh, China's central government and uh, their investments abroad have to be approved uh, by uh, Ministry of Commerce. Uh, they include the oil companies, China National Petroleum Company, CNPC, uh, CNOC, and uh, Sinopec as well as uh, China Power Investment and Sinosteel, uh, which are amongst the largest Chinese investors in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The state-owned commercial bank, uh, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, ICBC, is also a significant investor in the region as the result of its acquisition of a 20% share of a South African Standard Bank in 2007. Provincial and municipal SOEs, uh, sometimes referred to as local funds, come under the subnational authorities. The most significant uh, provincially owned SOEs active in Sub-Saharan Africa are um, Shantung Iron and Steel, owned by Shantung uh, Provincial Government, and uh, Jinchuan Group, controlled by Kansu Provincial Authorities. Provincial SOEs have also been particularly uh, active in the agribusiness sector in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. There are also some large private Chinese firms such as Sichuan Hongda and uh, Qingho Energy, uh, which have uh, significant uh, investments uh, in the region. Finally, the Chinese-owned uh, uh, SMEs are often firms set up by Chinese migrants, so there is a question as to whether they should be regarded as FDI according to the standard uh, definitions. Although the activities of uh, SOEs in Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, attracted the most attention, the vast majority of Chinese firms possibly in number-wise, as much as 90% of the total are private. A recent survey found that the share of private firms in the total number of Chinese companies uh, ranged from 75% in Angola to 95% in Nigeria. While uh, private firms are smaller than SOEs, uh, so that uh, their share of investment does not match their numbers, uh, they are becoming increasingly significant players in Sub-Saharan Africa. Unlike investment by uh, state-owned enterprises, which tend to be concentrated in extractive industries and construction, Chinese private investments in the region is dominated by manufacturing and service industries. As for Chinese interest in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is useful to distinguish between three main sets of interests which have influenced Chinese engagement uh, in the region. Uh, first, uh, there are strategic diplomatic objectives of the Chinese government, which include the isolation of Taiwan, obtaining diplomatic support in international fora, uh, 
and increasing China's software in the region, uh, presenting it as an alternative to the West. Uh, these are uh, the essential concerns of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Second, there are strategic economic objectives which include the security of supplies of energy and mineral resources, reducing dependence on trade with the West, and uh, supporting the international expansion of a Chinese company. These issues are of a particular concern to Ministry of Commerce, the Chinese policy banks, and some state-owned enterprises. Finally, there are the commercial uh, objectives of firms and uh, entrepreneurs seeking new sources of profit and opportunities, which are the dominant concerns of the private investors and traders, but are also important for some Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises. The relative importance of these objectives have varied over time and uh, according to the type of economic involvement in the region. In the second half of the 20th century, Chinese interest in Sub-Saharan Africa was primarily uh, political. In the 21st century, economic relations have become much more significant with the uh, growth of trade. Uh, outward foreign direct investment, Chinese projects, loans and aid. Nevertheless, there are analysts and commentators who view uh, China's growing economic involvement in the region has a geopolitical motivations to displace uh, the United States and uh, European uh, influence in Africa as a part of China's rise to global hegemony. Given the growing assertiveness of a foreign policy behavior of China in recent years, the Chinese distrust in the bandwagoning uh, strategy and belief in balancing strategy, which is uh, historically ingrained into the Chinese strategic model. On this uh, uh, topic, I hope I have a chance uh, to discuss this uh, sometime. And the long time uh, horizon of the Chinese policymakers, I would not be surprised if Chinese have an ulterior geopolitical and strategic uh, motives in dealings with Africa. But as in the case of uh, uh, Latin America, I will not go into a realm that is beyond confirmation or disconfirmation. Setting aside the geopolitical motives, China has uh, other political objectives in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, to achieve those objectives, it indeed uses uh, its economic muscle. One such political objective is uh, isolation of Taiwan. One China policy has been a constant in Chinese foreign policy. China used the economic incentives to win over African governments to its side. This led to an increasing number of countries in the region uh, recognizing Beijing. Malawi uh, switched uh, uh, in 2007 and received a six billion US dollars uh, financial package from China. At that time, only four 
sub-Saharan African countries still had relations with the Taiwan. I mean diplomatic relations with Taiwan. When uh, pro-independence uh, Chai Ing-wen became president uh, in 2016, competition for recognition started again. Gambia, San Tomi e Principe, and Burkina Faso switched their recognition from Taiwan to Beijing, leaving uh, Swaziland alone, having no relations in Africa. Not surprisingly, countries which recognized Taiwan got very little in terms of FDI projects, loans, and aid from the People's Republic. However, with only uh, Swaziland uh, uh, still recognizing Taiwan, you can expect that uh, this has become a less important factor in the People's Republic of China's relations with the region. But um, isolation of Taiwan uh, still figures uh, important uh, as uh, indicated uh, by uh, two incidents. In January 2017, Nigeria virtually shut down Taiwanese mission uh, in that country. In return, 40 billion US dollars investment was promised for Nigeria alone by China. In December 2016, mayor of Pretoria uh, in South Africa announced his plan to visit Taiwan. A, a diplomatic row ensued. Africa remains important to China because of the number of votes uh, that the region has within the uh, United Nations. Uh, for example, it has sought the support of African countries in votes uh, at the UN Human Rights Council, uh, which are critical of its uh, human rights record. China also looked to its relations with Africa in the aftermath of the repression of the protests in Tiananmen Square in uh, 1989 when uh, it feared isolation by the West. Again, in the run-up to the Beijing Olympics uh, in 2008, when the issue of Tibet came uh, to the fore, China was able to look for support from some African governments. China has also sought support from African governments in other international fora. Uh, at the first uh, FOCAC uh, meeting in Beijing uh, in 2000, the Chinese Minister of Foreign Trade and Economic Cooperation, uh, Xu Guangsheng, uh, thanked the African countries for their support for China's uh, accession uh, to the WTO. China also seeks to use uh, its uh, economic involvement in Africa to promote its image internationally. This is uh, a projection of its soft power presenting China as a different kind of global power from the United States and Europe that is itself part of the global south. It emphasizes its uh, common experience with other developing uh, countries and bases its relations with uh, uh, sub saharan Africa on sincerity, friendship, and equality recognizes the sovereignty of African states and does not seek to impose political or uh, economic conditionality. This involves elements of a continuity in the rhetoric of official statements 
since the involvement of China in Africa during the Maoist period, which emphasized a common history of exploitation by uh, imperialist powers and the struggle for development. China does not seek to impose uh, its own model on the sub-Saharan African countries, but um, admiration for the Chinese uh, model in Africa uh, is seen as an important uh, aspect of uh, uh, China's soft power, and uh, it provides legitimacy for the Chinese uh, Communist Party back home. As I said before, economic interests uh, have come to play a much more significant role in Sino-African relations in the 21st century uh, than uh, in the earlier periods. And uh, they appear now more important than political factors. One indication of the relative significance of economic as opposed to diplomatic factors in relations with us, Sub-Saharan Africa is the roles played by Ministry of Commerce and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ministry of Commerce deals with the economic aspects, whereas Ministry of Foreign Affairs is responsible for political affairs, and it has been argued that uh, Ministry of Commerce's uh, influence has increased relative to that of the Minister of Foreign Affairs in recent uh, years. Unlike many other countries, where aid is seen as a part of uh, uh, foreign policy and uh, foreign Affairs Ministry plays an important role. As I said, in China, it is the Ministry of Commerce that is the key ministry in relation to aid. Oil and minerals are at the heart of economic relationship between China and Sub-Saharan Africa. This is reflected in the composition of the imports from Sub-Saharan Africa and the main sectors in which Chinese firms have uh, invested. As I discussed earlier, China's imports from Africa are almost entirely of uh, primary products and uh, RVMs, resource-based materials. Oil has accounted for almost half of all Chinese imports uh, from the region, and the minerals and metals account for between a quarter and a third in recent years. Around a fifth of China's oil imports come from Africa. The region is also a major source of some key minerals, accounting for more than half of China's imports of diamonds and manganese, two-thirds of the platinum and chromium ores, and all of its cobalt imports. Sub-Saharan Africa is important for China to increase resource security including the diversification of sources of import, acquisition of resources abroad by Chinese firms, and long-time contracts with uh, foreign uh, suppliers. The strategic economic interests are so obvious that uh, I would not uh, discuss it uh, further. In countries where the role of the state has been reduced through the structural adjustment of policies, which have expanded the role for the private sector 
trade patterns are determined by firms uh, following uh, current competitive advantage. Uh, it is not surprising then that uh, commercial factors are key to explaining the growth of Chinese exports to sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Chinese and uh, African uh, traders importing consumer goods to the region are clearly commercially motivated and uh, they are taking advantage of the highly competitive prices of manufacturers in China. It is true that uh, the China uh, Exim Bank uh, does facilitate exports by providing credit to suppliers and buyers, but the main factor driving exports is demand in Africa. Indeed, the Chinese exports to sub-Saharan Africa tend to be concentrated in the larger markets. The importance of commercial factors is particularly evident in the case of mining, where the structure of ownership is much more diverse than in oil industry. While the Chinese oil industry is controlled by the three state-owned enterprises, the mining industry is characterized by a more diverse structure with the provincial and local state-owned enterprises and some private companies also playing a part. Chinese mining uh, SOEs and companies from other sectors, such as steel and construction, have invested in mines overseas to increase their reserves, uh, secure vital inputs, or diversify their business activities. There is also a significant number of small-scale Chinese uh, miners operating in sub-Saharan Africa. In Ghana, the first wave of gold miners from China arrived in the 1990s, well before the state-owned enterprises. And a large second wave uh, influx occurred around 2010 when the gold prices soared. By 2013, it was estimated that there were more than 10,000 Chinese miners in Ghana. A large number of uh, small-scale Chinese firms were also involved in mining uh, in Katanga province uh, in the Democratic Republic uh, of the Congo in the late uh, 2000s. While SOE's investments in sub-Saharan Africa is the result of both the strategic objectives of the Chinese state and the uh, uh, commercial objectives of the SOEs themselves, the growing number of private Chinese companies operating in sub-Saharan Africa is uh, commercially driven. Access to the local market, taking advantage of uh, African trade agreement, low production costs, and the uh, local availability of raw materials uh, figure important in private Chinese firms' investment decisions. The growing activities of Chinese construction companies in Africa can also be seen as being driven, at least in part, by commercial consideration in many instances. Competition in the Chinese construction market is intense, and as the domestic 
construction market became saturated, major firms looked to find new firms. Since uh, both private firms and uh, state-owned enterprises have commercial interests in sub-Saharan Africa, it is quite possible that uh, these will sometimes uh, run counter uh, to the strategic, economic, and political objectives of the Chinese uh, state. This is not just uh, a possibility. Uh, Actually, uh, we can find some instances of uh, such a collision. The sale of equity oil by state-owned enterprises to the international market rather than to China is an example of uh, companies prioritizing their own profitability ahead of the state's aim of increased uh, energy security. Similarly, the use of uh, Chinese workers may have made uh, commercial sense for the firms involved in terms of cost and labor discipline, but it uh, created uh, resentment amongst the local population in some countries, undermining the efforts of the government to portray the relationship between China and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as a win-win situation. The environmental impact of Chinese companies is another issue that has led to conflict with the local populations and has tarnished it the image of China in the region. In these cases, the commercial interests of Chinese companies have harmed the government's effort to increase its soft power in the region. Focusing solely on Chinese actors and their strategic and commercial interest in sub-Saharan Africa uh, runs the risk of uh, uh, ignoring uh, African strategic and commercial interests. Focusing solely on Chinese actors and their strategic and commercial interests uh, in sub-Saharan uh, Africa uh, runs the risk of ignoring uh, African uh, agency in the development of uh, Sino-African relations. As the probable cause, it takes uh, two to tangle, or as a Korean saying goes, it takes uh, two hands to clap. Actually, we can apply the same classification scheme of strategic political, strategic economy, and commercial aspects we used in uh, discussing Chinese interests to analyzing African uh, interests. From a strategic political viewpoint, the Chinese policy of non-interference in the internal affairs of African countries and uh, not imposing any political conditionality on borrowing countries uh, makes engagement with China very attractive for many uh, rulers in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this has been a major Western criticism of China's involvement in the region on the grounds that it provides support for authoritarian uh, regimes. But even for countries which are relatively democratic, China's uh, no strings attached approach must be uh, attractive. And uh, Chinese loans and aid can also serve uh, to legitimize and generate the political support uh, for ruling elites in uh, 
sub-Saharan Africa. Both the infrastructure and prestige projects such as uh, government buildings and sports stadiums serve a useful political purpose. In Angola, the majority of the stadiums built for the African Basketball Championships in 2007 and the African Cup of Nations in 2010 were built by Chinese companies. What the Angolan government got was the political benefit of a very rapid, very visible improvement in infrastructure in the months, days before the country's elections as the result of uh, Chinese loans. In uh, strategic economic terms, African countries face a chronic shortage of infrastructure in power, transport, and communications. The World Bank estimated back in 2010 that external financial resources required to meet the infrastructure gap was as much as 31 billion US dollars. Of course, African states uh, have uh, neither the government revenue nor the foreign exchange reserves necessary to finance major infrastructure projects on this scale. Western uh, leaders and investors uh, were not uh, particularly interested in funding such projects. Part of the reason uh, was that uh, the World Bank and the other Western donors who in an earlier era uh, had provided uh, loans for infrastructure had uh, since the 1980s concentrated uh, much more on program uh, lending uh, and uh, targeted uh, social sectors such as health and education rather than infrastructure. The EU and uh, its member countries uh, provided only a small amount for uh, infrastructure investment. In this context, African governments uh, uh, have been uh, very keen to take advantage of uh, China's uh, willingness to finance large uh, infrastructure projects uh, in the region. They had the difficulty of obtaining uh, funding elsewhere on terms uh, uh, which they deemed uh, acceptable. So the interests of the African rulers in obtaining political support through large-scale infrastructure projects were an important driver of the loans from uh, the African side. Therefore, the extensive use of commodity-backed loans in sub-Saharan Africa uh, is the result of a convergence of different uh, interests, including those of African elites uh, in obtaining external funds, the strategic interests of the Chinese state in securing raw materials and new markets, uh, the commercial interests of the Exim Bank in securing uh, repayment of uh, its loans, and the interests of uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises in expanding their reserves and long-term growth and profitability. African commercial interests have also played a role in the growth of economic relations with China. Growing numbers of African traders have um, been involved in importing consumer goods from China. There is a thriving African business uh, 
community in Guangzhou, uh, as I uh, said. African uh, traders uh, traveled to Guangzhou to buy goods since the mid-1990s. These compete with uh, Chinese traders in supplying African markets. Indeed, in some African uh, countries, it has been uh, claimed that uh, they are a more important source of uh, uh, imported Chinese consumer goods than the Chinese traders who operate in Africa. In recent years, an increasing proportion of uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's uh, imports from China have been capital goods. Local manufacturers have found that uh, Chinese machinery and equipment is uh, much cheaper than that supplied from the West. Although uh, it may not be as durable, it is an attractive alternative for small cash-strapped business. Uh, in some cases, the capital uh, goods can be imported uh, on very favorable terms where uh, the China's uh, Exim Bank uh, promoted uh, exportation of the products and uh, provided uh, financial support for the exporters and the importers. Okay, that's for today. And uh, I will continue my uh, lecture uh, very shortly next time. Bye-bye.